He has been called the high priest of hi-fi, the mad genius of audio, a legend in his own time. He has been honored for his achievements by everyone from his alma mater to the Acoustical Society of America. Without a doubt, Paul Klipsch is one of the great pioneers of audio, yet his fascination with things mechanical has led him down many a varied and interesting path. In his 90 years, Paul has worked on trains, piloted planes, and holds patents in the fields of geophysics and ballistics, as well as audio acoustics. Most people, however, associate Paul W. Klipsch with the invention of the Klipsch horn, the revolutionary speaker that became the cornerstone of a multi-million dollar company in tiny Hope, Arkansas. The Paul Klipsch story begins in another small town, Elkhart, Indiana, where Paul was born in 1904. From both sides of his family, Paul inherited abilities, latent talents, energies, determination, a dry wit, a sense of humor, independence, and faith. The Klipsch family moved from Elkhart to Lafayette, Indiana, where Paul's father, Oscar Klipsch, taught mechanical engineering at Purdue University. Almost from infancy, Paul's insatiable curiosity was evident. When he was barely walking, Paul escaped the backyard, wandered across the Wabash Bridge, and was later found across the river, unharmed and unabashed. When Paul was eight, the family moved again, this time to the Southwest, to ease Oscar Klipsch's failing health. After her husband's death, Paul's mother, Minna Eddie Klipsch, took a job teaching Spanish at El Paso High School. Paul claims to have graduated from El Paso High School 101st in a class of 101 students. Although his father died when he was only 12, Paul reckons the twig was bent pretty young as he decided to study electrical engineering at New Mexico State University. New Mexico State has recognized its illustrious alumnus with an honorary Doctor of Laws degree and with the dedication of the Paul W. Klipsch Lecture Hall in 1993. Of all the machines Paul Klipsch has loved in his life, his longest devotion has been to railroads. In the 1920s, he spent nearly four years in Tocopilla, Chile, maintaining electric locomotives. On the voyage to South America, he married his late wife, Belle, for whom he named the Belle Klipsch speaker. It was also in Chile that Paul was first introduced to a horn type of loudspeaker in the form of a box with a horn curled up inside of it. His experiments with the horn and with direct radiator speakers brought him to the conclusion that horns are more efficient. Years later, Paul would establish Klipsch's law. Distortion is inversely proportional to efficiency. Upon returning from Chile, Paul went to Stanford University and earned a Master of Science degree in electrical engineering. His next move was to Houston, Texas, where he was employed as a geophysicist in the field of oil exploration. In his spare time, Paul continued to tinker with speaker design. An idea had been percolating in his head since a fellow graduate student had suggested that any speaker would work better if put into a corner. By 1946, Paul had completed his first successful corner horn speaker. As a young boy, Paul had been given a cornet by a family friend. While at college, he played in the Aggie band. Paul says, the experience never made a musician out of him, but gave him a knowledge and love of music, musicians, and musical instruments. One of those loves is Paul's wife, Valerie, an accomplished concert pianist, wooed by Mr. Klipsch playing the symphony through a pair of his speakers. What could be more natural, Paul has said, than to join the science of radio, electronics, and audio to music? At the end of World War II, Paul went into speaker design full-time, renting a tin shed behind a laundry in Hope, Arkansas, the small southern town where he had served as second-in-command at the Army Munitions Proving Grounds. The rental on the shed was $10 a month. In 1946, Paul registered the name Klipsha and Associates, although he didn't hire his first employee, a carpenter, until 1948. The airplane, like the electric train, was a machine that captured Paul's imagination. In the early days of Klipsch & Associates, he would fly from dealer to dealer to demonstrate his speakers. Paul built a special speaker that would fit in the back of his airplane and could be hooked up along with a dealer's single Klipsch horn to demonstrate the fledgling concept of stereo. Paul continued to demonstrate Klipsch speakers via air until the late 70s. Another of Paul's innovations was the anechoic chamber in the engineering department at the Klipsch factory. 
While Paul admits he stole the concept of the anechoic chamber from some other thief, he designed what was, and probably still is, the only anechoic chamber specifically created to test corner loudspeakers. Over the years, Paul Klipsch has written a score of papers and articles on the subject of audio acoustics and is internationally recognized as one of the leaders in the field. High Fidelity Magazine once called Paul the image of one who pushes toward the frontier and reestablishes it wherever he arrives. He has been mentor, instructor, and inspiration to the industry for nearly 50 years. Klipsch's law, distortion is inversely proportional to efficiency, has been the foundation for speakers coveted by audio connoisseurs for their broad dynamic range and clear, true sound. The little company that began in a tin shed has grown into one of the most respected manufacturers of loudspeakers in the world, a company with a reputation for unwavering dedication to quality. Though he's been retired a few years, you can still find PWK at the office every morning. Visitors to the Klipsch factory are often rewarded with an introduction to the man himself. An occasional lucky soul is invited to Paul's house to listen to old Bell Telephone Laboratories recordings from the 1930s. Nearly 30 years ago, Paul wrote, Just why the Almighty singles out some individuals of questionable moral quality to carry some particular burden is not for us to know. Seems though, history is full of such examples. If my course in the past was by divine inspiration, my prayer is that I can carry out the resulting obligation. If this entails waging war on the quacks and sharpies of the fringe of the art, I pray for strength and guidance, for I'd rather work than fight. And just to remind those manufacturers with outlandish claims that Paul W. Klipsch is still fighting the good fight, he sums up his opinions with the unofficial company motto,